But now I would like to introduce Brett Tasker, another one of the Silver Stripe crew. Hello, Hello, Brett. How's it going? Everything is fine. Uh, and uh, you are talking about a Silver Stripe on large scale, is it right? Yeah, so today I'd be doing a bit of a talk about uh, infrastructure and design uh, with working with Silver Stripe applications at scale and large Silver Stripe applications. Uh, so it's a very technical discussion. So I hope everyone's got their thinking hats on. Yeah. Thank you and have fun. Awesome. Thank you. Let's get my uh, share started here. All right, I uh, assume that's coming through okay. Yep, here we are. All right, so yeah, today I'm gonna be covering um, a bit of a talk about working with Silverstripe at scale, uh, focusing on the design and architecture for Silverstripe applications themselves um, and the components surrounding them. Um, so I'll just do a quick start off, just a quick uh, about me as well. Um, just noticed uh, slides aren't changing there. So I'll just quickly try and fix that. All right, let's try that. Um, so just quick about me, uh, my name is Brett Tasker. I work at Silverstripe Limited in New Zealand as a principal platform engineer and a security specialist. Um, I've been with Silverstripe since the early 2015. Um, I work within a team that is responsible for managing multiple platforms with many size, different sized um, applications. Um, and I spend a lot of my time with uh, my head in performance analysts, tooling and security. Um, so you've probably seen my sort of interactions and my work on the community Slack channels before or the forum um, or through some of the other things I've created, such as my um, Docker images or the garbage collection module is one of my more recent things. Um, so today I'm just going to be covering off a few topics um, regarding uh, Silverstripe at scale. Um, so we'll be focusing more on the performance side of this talk due to the limited time and countless subjects that I could be discussing here. Um, but we'll first start off with a quick introduction into the terminology about scalability, and then we'll move on to some more details of infrastructure and architecture um, before moving on to talking about sort of the performance side of things. Um, when we're talking about performance, we'll start looking at the uh, infrastructure as well as the supporting components and then digging into Silverstripe CMS and the code itself. Um, so this includes things like resource allocation, resource relationships, bottlenecks of PHP and MySQL, um, and some intricacies about the actual Silverstripe CMS itself. Um, this includes a bit of a dive into the framework components and a heavy amount of caching talk. Um, so there's probably information in here for everyone within there, um, but hopefully I don't lose you on the technicality. Uh, all right, to, to start off, I'm uh, just going to talk about scalability at first. Um, I'm just noticing my slides aren't changing. Let's see if I can fix that quickly. All right, so scalability is the property of a system to handle a growing amount of work by adding resources to the system. Um, so this doesn't always just mean about uh, infrastructure itself, like the CPU and memory. Scalability to applies to a lot of different components of IT administration or even just businesses in general. Um, they apply to many different dimensions, um, which a few of them I'm just going to go over here. It's very slow and catching up. Um, so first of all, there's administrative scalability. Um, so administrative scalability is the ability to uh, increase a number of organizations or users to access the system. Um, we also have functional scalability, which is the ability to enhance the system by adding new functionality without disrupting existing activities. Uh, there's geographic scalability, which is the ability to maintain effectiveness during expansion from a local area to a larger region. Um, there's load scalability, which is more about the ability to, for a distri distributed system to expand and contract to accommodate heavier lo or lighter loads. Um, this includes the ease of which a system or components can also be modified, added, or removed to accommodate changing loads. There's also generation scalability, which is about more about the ability to for a system to scale by adopting new generations of components. And uh, I always get struggled with this word, uh, heterogeneous scalability which is the ability to adopt components from different vendors. Um, as I mentioned before, due to the limited time, we're just gonna focus mostly on low scalability within this talk. 
Um, so with, we're, when working with smaller Silverstrap applications, um, consideration of supporting infrastructure is often less of a requirement, um, as the functionality and requirements of the project can often be met without the need for complicated infrastructure. However, when this need does arise, you may start to encounter issues with your architecture's ability to scale. Um, so let's take a look, quick look at sort of infrastructure architecture and how it affects your decisions made through your application design. Um, so first quick view we're going to take a look at is the load balance architecture, which you may be already familiar with. Um, it's also known as multi-server architecture. Um, it basically follows the principle in which a load balancer is used to distribute load across multiple application servers. This style of architecture has a large benefit over your standard single server architecture in that additional resources, in this case application servers, can be added and removed from the pool of application servers as needed on the low requirements. This is known as horizontal scaling. Uh, horizontal scaling allows you to adjust your available resources based on your requirements without causing unneeded outages as you would often incur through vertical scaling, um, in which vertical scaling is more about adding more CPU and memory to an existing server. Load balance architecture is not a simple out of the box replacement uh, when it comes to Silverstripe applications. Uh, considerations do need to be given uh, to data that is required to be shared between application servers, such as the database or assets or other content that needs to be identical across application servers. Um, these are often referred to as shared resources. Shared resources usually comes out of a need or a dependency for this requirement, as shared resources can often have a performance bottleneck themselves, depending on resource limitations. Um, however, with appropriate controls and or a shared service that allows you to scale that as needed, you should be able to handle loads of almost any size. Uh, so microservice uh, architectural design is a bit of a different uh, creature to multi-server architecture. Um, it combines both architecture and design together with a focus for scalability through separation of responsibilities. Um, the microservice architecture enables the rapid, frequent, and reliable delivery of large complex applications. It also enables an organization to evolve its technology stack through progressive independent updates across the services rather than monolithic changes. This architecture can be applied not only to the separation of infrastructure components, such as Nginx or PHP, um, but also applies to the applications themselves, such as a payment processor or an inventory service. Silverstripe has historically been a monolithic application in which a single PHP application handles all of the HTTP requests, processing, collection, and serving of content. However, with the introduction of Headless and Silverstripe 4, this became less of a requirement and opens up opportunities within this microservice architecture space. The idea behind microservice architecture is that repeated processes within a task can be separated out and managed independently of each other. Uh, these use services usually talk to each other through a communication layer, such as a REST API or WSDL or something like that. Um, and these different services should be independently managed so that they can be scaled and managed without impacting the other services directly. The setup also helps to spread your team's skills to be focused on the area they are best at. Um, developers focusing on payment provider solutions could focus on just the payment provider services. This is just a very high level view of this architecture. Um, there are many other limitations and restrictions when it comes to microservice architecture in the IT industry. Um, so I highly recommend checking out uh, the resources available at microservices.io. Uh, they have some very good guides for assessing if microservice architecture is right for you. Uh, so next, we're going to take a look at the uh, web server architecture. Uh, so web server architecture looks a bit more into the relationship between web server applications, such as Nginx and, P um, and Apache, um, to the PHP executor itself. So the first one I want to look at here is something you're probably already familiar with, um, mod PHP. Um, it's uh, implementation using Apache. Uh, this is the most common web server setup for PHP applications to date, and is recommended by most available documentation. And this setup works well for most basic low-level traffic sites. Um, however, when looking at large applications at scale, reliability, security, scalability, and speed become much more important. ModPHP itself is an Apache module that is loaded by Apache on every request. This means every request to Apache, whether it be for PHP or a static asset, has the added burden of loading the PHP module as overhead each time, consuming those additional resources. As the Apache parent process receives a request, it forks itself and sends the request to a child process. This child process has the Apache module and PHP loaded, requiring that additional overhead again. It can still use shared memory optimization, such as APCU and OP cache to improve performance, but at scale, this additional overhead does incur a measurable wastage of resources. 
Uh, fast CGI and uh, FPM are good alternatives to mod PHP um, as it ex abstracts the PHP execution from the web server services. This allows you to scale and operate PHP independently of the web server services, as well as reduce resource overhead. Um, it also supports both microservice and low, load balance architecture through this abstraction. Fast CGI is a way to accelerate frequently accessed pages on the site. Fast CGI works in a way that a single process can handle many requests before being terminated. This reduces the overhead of starting a new PHP process every time there is a new page request. Being an event-driven execution, the abstracted PHP process is only required for the processing of PHP, allowing the web application to serve static assets without the overhead of a PHP interpreter. Uh, FPM, or uh, if it's known as Fast CGI Process Manager, is an alternative uh, PHP Fast CGI implementation with some additional features, which are mostly used for heavy-loaded sites. FPM provides a management service around PHP, allowing for graceful starts and stops, um, which helps ensure that requests are not lost during scaling events, such as removing an unneeded server from a server pool. Uh, so next we're gonna jump into performance. Um, so efficient performance at scale is all about balancing speed of execution against your resources. Uh, if you can execute your request faster, then you need less concurrency to support your load. However, using resources to improve speed is usually limited by the cost of those resources. Um, by resources in this case, we're talking specifically about CPU, memory, disk, and network. Uh, so performance is about how we use these resources as efficiently as possible. This may be achieved through code changes and optimizations of execution within PHP itself, or configuration of systems uh, that support the execution of code, such as Apache, PHP, and caching. Uh, in this section, we'll dig a little bit deeper and more details on the performance of for Silverstripe applications when working at scale. Um, and we also look at some of the known bottlenecks when working with load balance architecture and large Silverstripe applications as well as some performance optimizations you may consider when designing your application. Uh, so resource relationship, the core part of the uh, architecture for Silverstripe websites or any web really website is the actual underlying hardware and operating system running the web server and PHP services. Uh, to understand resource limitations and how they impact each other uh, and how they impact Silverstripe applications, we're just quickly gonna go over some uh, basics of the three major resources and how they relate to each other. Um, so first of all, we've got a CPU, memory, and disk we're just going to cover here. Uh, so the CPU is obviously the brain of the server. It handles the logical processing operations. Um, so essentially, if you want data from your RAM, uh, the request response needs to go through the CPU and be processed. Um, same as if you want data to, or to read or write from the disk, the request and response needs to go through the CPU to be processed. Um, RAM obviously is pretty straightforward. It holds temporary data that is needed by systems in the application. Uh, calls to the RAM usually originate from the CPU. And so the ability for data to be saved and read from memory is directly related to the capability of the CPU at that time. Uh, disk drives store permanent data. Um, and like memory, it also originates from the CPU. Um, so its capabilities are directly related to the CPU. There are many other relationships between and around these components, but for the purpose of simplicity and time, we're just gonna look at these basic relationships. Now, because the CPU is the brain of the system, uh, limitations and resources usually start their identification at the CPU itself. CPU processing has a limited number of threads or, or requests that can be processed at any given time. Uh, the request and response of this communication and the limitations around concurrency is usually referred to as I.O. Uh, disks also have a limitation on I.O. at the controller, as you can see in this diagram, but it's slightly different from CPU I.O. Because there is a, fine num uh, a finite number of I.O. that can be handled at any given time, you can see how limitations in other hardware can flow down the surrounding components um, and affect other areas. Uh, a performance issue at the disk can cause IO channels at the CPU to be held up waiting for the disk to respond. Um, and this is one, more common, one of the more common forms of IO issues you, you see that present themselves as IO weight on the CPU. So if your CPU becomes IO bound, everything that rec also requires the CPU as a processor is affected by these limitations. Um, this, is, this is what can cause small performance issues to become exponential issues at scale. Uh, the game of load scalability is a game of performance, and performance is all about resource management. Uh, CPU performance. Um, so I'm just going to quickly quite go over some information about PHP and CPU performance. Um, so PHP is a single-threaded execution chain. Um, this means that each execution that PHP performs um, can only natively use a single thread. Uh, there are extensions for PHP available that do support multi-threading, such as pthreads. However, this is not currently supported by Silverstripe CMS. Uh, 
Uh, when using a fork-based PHP processing, uh, such as mod PHP or PHP FPM, uh, each fork of PHP can access only a single core. Uh, however, each can access a different core for execution if required. This results in each child process being able to use a different core if needed. A CPU's ability to perform single thread execution is more related to the frequency of the CPU than the number of cores it supports. Um, so the frequency is often you see is like that three gigahertz or 5.2 gigahertz or whatever you're seeing. Um, so a CPU's single threaded performance has a significant impact on PHP execution. Um, in other words, PHP really likes high frequency CPUs. Why is this an issue? Well, common web hosting CPUs are often high core, con core count and low frequency, which makes them not very suitable for single threaded PHP applications. However, on the other hand, web server services such as Nginx and Apache um, that is actually responding to web requests prefers the number of cores to their frequency as serving concurrent users is a multi-threaded task. Same goes for database services and other shared components. That's why looking at just the CPU frequency to solve web hosting problems is not enough. This is where microservice architecture can assist. Separation of, micro, of web servers and database services into their own server pools allows you to use different CPUs for different components, depending on requirements. High core CPUs for web servers and database services while these CPUs with high frequencies for PHP services. Um, so I'm just going to get a bit more into actual PHP performance itself. Um, so when looking at performance within PHP um, at scale, it requires a bit of a different lens. Uh, a small performance impact on a small site would probably go unnoticed. But when you scale that up to thousands or tens of thousands of requests, these small performance issues start to grow often exponentially. Um, so one of the ways PHP does uh, do handle uh, performance is through caching. Um, so APCU is probably one of the more commonly known caches. It's a, a code controlled key value store user cache that is directly accessed through the PHP functions. Um, APCU is included in the Silverstripe CMS default cache factory as a user cache that can be used out of the box. However, as APCU is a PHP module itself, its key value store is local to the machine and PHP parent process that the system runs on. This means that basic CGI implementations are unable to share memory as there is no parent process running to retain the data. However, mod PHP and PHP FPM use a constantly running parent process and will spawn child processes with shared access to that memory. So APCU can be used for these setups. APCU has a default shim size of about 32 megabytes, allowing only your 32 megabytes of data to be shared between PHP processes. Um, trying to save data past this point can result in an APCU memory exhaustion warning in the PHP logs. Um, and you actually now are wasting execution time in trying to read that memory or save to it again on each request. Increasing the shim size in PHP INI will increase the memory requirements of the PHP process. Um, but will also allow you to cache larger objects in APCU. So knowing your cache requirements for your application will help you manage the setting appropriately. Uh, on the other side of uh, PHP is the OP cache. Um, so OP cache is different. It's not a user cache. It's a built-in bytecode cache, which when enabled will store pre-compiled PHP code for faster execution. Like APCU, it uses a shared memory that is local to the machine and PHP process. It is also included in Silverstripe CMS default cache factory for user caching. However, it should not be used for this. And I'll dig a little bit deeper into that uh, later on in this talk. Uh, OP cache is a purpose-built cache engine for PHP and works different from user caches like APCU. The PHP code within PHP files uh, for your application and dependencies is pre-compiled and stored in the PHP process's shared memory. Because, because of this caching code, it does not expect its cache data to change often. And so it does not actually perform any garbage collection like a user cache would. OP cache instead empties its cache through restarting of the PHP process. Um, OP cache will actually trigger the PHP to restart internally if the amount of wasted resources or wasted memory threshold is met. Um, and that's one of the OP cache settings you can set. Because OP cache acts like a permanent cache, if the total memory needed for the application is smaller than what is allocated via configuration, it can result in actual performance degradation through excessive cache lookups. Um, however, if you are using OP cache to cache data that changes over time, uh, such as user cache data, as the cache fills up with wasted dirty data, because um, as it changes, it gets marked as dirty, it will actually cause the PHP process to restart and purging that cache and causing it to need a rebuild. And as with most caches, building a cache takes more time than having no cache at all. Um, so this can uh, result in slower applications or partial performance degradation. 
it also ends up getting yourself into um, what's known as a um, degradation loop in which your wasted data of your application is constantly filling up the OP cache, restarting it and rebuilding it often. Ensuring you are using this cache appropriately will help reduce performance degradations through misconfiguration. Um, you can adjust the memory allocation for OP cache in your PHP INI file, just like APCEU. Um, and you can do this by adjusting the memory uh, consumption setting. Um, as with APCU settings, this affects the amount of resources required by a PHP. Now, on the other side of things, uh, there are a couple more caches I just wanted to cover as well, uh, which is the Redis and Memcache. Um, now, these ones aren't so natively supported, um, but they uh, do work uh, with shared modules and stuff with Silverstripe CMS. Um, and they're actually more suited for load balance architecture. So when using load balance architecture, memory is unable to be shared between the application servers and the application server pool. As such, using externally shared cache uh, servers, such as Redis or Memcache, uh, allows you to share cache data between the application servers. Um, it also frees up the resources on each of those application servers as they don't need to use APCU for individual caching. Um, this gives you more resources, which allows for higher concurrency. Uh, Redis and Memcache are both application-based uh, cache stores. Um, they, are, they are key value stores as well. Um, and But the difference is they can be communicated via TCP. Um, as they are application-based caches, they are not limited in locality to the same server like APCU or OP cache. This allows more flexibility and potential for using them as fully shared caches for the application pool or other uh, shared services. I won't go into too much detail on how these services and their pros and cons, um, as that information is really available online. However, like with APCU and OP cache, you might find that the default settings may be a bit small for these. Uh, MySQL. So MySQL being a relational database, does not perform well at scale with large amounts of data natively. Um, as such, performance improvements like using NODB and query caching can be used to relieve some of the stress from database and provide faster performance uh, response times for queries. Um, so let's just take a look at some of those performance conditions. So the first one I want to look at is NODB. Um, Silverstripe uses NODB quite heavily, and it's a good thing. Um, so MySQL's NODB is a low-level cache used for storing table data and index data. It uses memory and file system caching to provide faster table lookups across all queries. Uh, there are two main components to perform performance with MySQL and ODB, which we'll look at, uh, buffers and flushing. Uh, buffers are used to temporarily store data in memory for faster lookups and execution, where flushing is used to write this cache data to a more permanent store. Uh, the NODB buffer pool is used heavily by MySQL NODB uh, caching. Um, and as a rule, the buffer pool size should be set to roughly about 60 to 80% of the total available RAM on the MySQL server. Um, this ensures that the MySQL server has enough resources to actually cache the corresponding data. Uh, keep in mind that you should leave RAM for the processes running in the operating system as well. Uh, NODB's buffer pool cache data is flushed to disk once a certain amount of cache data has been marked as dirty. Um, and this usually happens at the default threshold of approximately 10% of the buffer pool cache. The NODB log buffer uh, allows transactions to run without actually having to write to the, to the log on the disk. Um, this helps reduce IO on the disk for each transaction and provides a buffer for these transactions before flushing them. These logs are used for recovery operations, um, so a larger buffer will help reduce how often it needs to flush these to disk. Um, and obviously, flushing to disk takes up I/O, which is additional resources that could be associated with the NODB buffer. Uh, the log file size itself um, should ideally be as set as big as possible. Um, this having the set higher helps reduce your I/O load by not having to split it up across multiple files. Um, however, the larger file you get, um, the longer MySQL will actually take to perform restoration. Um, I haven't dug deeply into why that is the case, but it's uh, usually a case of the larger the NODB log file size, the more performance you can get out of it, but the longer it will take for restoration processes. So it's a bit of a hit and miss on that one as to what you setting you want to use, uh, but potentially restoration from backups could be a way to manage that NODB file size. Uh, MySQL caching. So query caching is the next one I want to take a bit of a look into. Um, so query caching is used for caching result sets of deterministic queries. Uh, it uses memory and file system caching to primarily remember uh, previously executed select queries and their result sets. Uh, if connected indexes and data do not differ between requests and the query is the same as the previous, a cached content of results is returned instead of using the MySQL engine. 
Uh, this feature does not support caching of result sets for queries that contain subqueries or require the creation of temporary tables. Um, when allocating memory to the query cache settings, uh, a larger allocation of memory does not always result in better performance. Due to the need for threads to lock the cache during updates, you may see lock contention issues with large scale. Uh, meanwhile, too small is not good since it needs a minimum size of about 40 kilobytes to allocate its structure. Uh, the exact size depends on the system architecture. Due to the nature of how MySQL evaluates query caching, it may not be as efficient as InnoDB caching and should only really be used if providing actual performance improvements. Otherwise, the resources associated with query caching may be better suited in InnoDB buffers. Um, if you are seeing low numbers of query caching than expected, check your ORM queries for subqueries or evaluate MySQL settings to reduce temporary tables. Uh, next I wanted to get into was a uh, Silverstripe CMS performance. Um, so Silverstripe CMS has some default assumptions and inefficiencies which you may or may not be aware of. Um, that can affect performance of an application at scale. So we're going to take a quick look into some of these uh, inefficiencies or some of these settings. Um, so the first one I want to talk about was the Apache dependency. Um, so Silverstripe CMS currently has a default dependency on Apache web server. Uh, this is currently a dependency due to the assets module in which Silverstripe uses HD access files to protect your private assets. Uh, this alone would prevent you from using Nginx or alternative web servers to do as they do not support HD access. Um, this also becomes a security concern if you are using Nginx um, because you'll find that your protected assets are now exposed by the public directory. Um, however, you can get around this dependency by using the SS protected uh, assets path environment variable to move your private content outside of the public directory. Um, that way, Nginx pointing to the public directory won't be able to access that private content, only PHP would. Uh, the versioned module. Um, so versioning is another inefficient implementation of history and draft content that is enabled by default for majority of Silverstripe CMS applications. Uh, versioning adds additional tables and data to the database for each data object it extends, and it also manipulates select queries to join these tables as needed. Uh, due to the lack of garbage collection in the version module, this can cause queries to become highly inefficient when working at scale. These queries also become more complicated and start to require temporary tables within the database in order to execute against the engine. This is another performance impact that does not scale nicely. Uh, it is recommended, well, I was sorry, I would recommend to only enable version features uh, for specific data objects that the feature set is required for. Um, if you only need historic audit data, then don't use the draft state of versioning. Um, if you don't need it for a data object, remove it entirely. Um, consider using backup restorations instead of versioning uh, if you need to roll back to different versions. Um, if you are unable to remove this module entirely or reduce this integration, it becomes a much more important to ensure you are deleting old data than it, uh, that is no longer required. Garbage collection can be performed to remove old database content, which will reduce the size of the query, improving performance overall. Uh, ORM queries. Um, so Silverstripe's ORM uses some pretty neat logic behind the scenes to craft database queries needed for your data set. Um, however, when you start including many, many relationships and other complicated data sets to these objects, the ORM becomes less efficient at performing these queries. Um, so rather than trying to do everything out of a single ORM call, consider separating these out into different or separated ORM calls um, themselves, and then combining the results from each of them to be used um, as data for the next call. This helps reduce complexity in the query, um, often removing things like subqueries or temporary tables, which allows you to lo uh, use a lot of the caching features to improve. Um, so you can actually see uh, performance improvements using multiple smaller queries over one giant large one. Database connections. Um, so Silverstripe CMS uses a single database connection per execution. This means that each execution of Silverstripe CMS via PHP gets its own dedicated database connection to execute queries. Um, this helps reduce overhead of the MySQL connection starting and closing whenever a query is required. However, it does create a one-to-one -one mapping of PHP concurrency to database concurrency. Um, so if you have a limited number of connections available on your database, you may also need to limit your number of PHP processes that can execute concurrently. Maxing out the database connections has an exponential degradation impact on the MySQL database. It forces PHP processes to queue and wait for connections, consuming more PHP workers and resources on the application servers. This causes other PHP requests to slow down as there is more PHP workers running and consuming resources. 
Because we are using a one-to-one -one mapping of database connections to PHP executions, slow PHP workers result in database connections being hold, held for longer as they are only closed when PHP is actually finished executing. Uh, this goes round and round until resources start exploding on both sides and application on database. So ensuring you have working, uh, so ensuring you're working to known limits and don't try to force more traffic into a service that is not configured to handle will help reduce your potential um, roll on effect. Uh, next section I want to get into here is partial caching. Um, so partial caching is a Silver Stripe CMS heavy feature. It provides a method for caching HTML and lookup content from the Silver Stripe uh, templates. Um, however, as these uh, contain HTML as well as parameter substitution, these can be quite large in size. And so in-memory caching uh, for partial caching may not be quite suited. Um, however, file system caching na natively supports large cache content quite well. So it, it does actually work quite well for partial caching. And I'll get a bit more into the caching side a bit later as well. Um, so now we've gone through all those different layers, uh, we're going to start looking at the next part, which is actually right. Well, how how do we go about implementing code design, like actually changing the code of my work and how it affects things? Um, so with an understanding of infrastructure architecture and the relationship between resources and performance, we can start to look at how Silverstripe CMS and code can be used to improve our application for the purpose of scalability. So one of the things uh, I wanted to point to here was the, um, you probably mentioned, heard me mentioned a couple of times, was the de default cache factory. Um, so Silverstripe CMS by default uses a default cache uh, factory to determine which caching functionality to use for all of the user caches in the application. Um, Silverstripe uses this user caching to improve performance by reducing repeated calls to expensive operations. Um, this includes caches such as the class manifest, uh, config manifest, partial caches, and a few others. The logic behind which adapter is used for caching is determined by the snippet of code you see on the screen. Um, it performs a logical evaluation of the features currently enabled to provide what, uh, what it thinks is the best solution for your caching needs. However, it may not be what you expect it to be. Uh, in this snippet, um, you can see uh, APCU uh, variable is a Boolean of the APCU functionality being supported. Um, the one that's not so obvious is PHP file supporters is actually a Boolean of OP cache functionality being supported. Um, so PHP files is the OP cache trigger. So if we look at this uh, logic here, we can follow it through and we can determine a few things. That if you have APCU disabled and OP cache enabled, then Silverstripe CMS will use OP cache only for all of your user data. Um, however, if you have APCU disabled and OP cache disabled, uh, Silverstripe CMS will use the file system only to cache all your data. Uh, if you do have APCU enabled, um, Silverstripe CMS actually uses a chain cache adapter. Um, now, a chain cache is different from a single um, caching adapter in that it provides a fallback for your uh, cache la layer. So in this case, APCU uses both APCU and the file system as a secondary cache fallback. So I'm going to go into those different cache adapters a little bit and sort of give some information on those. Um, so the file system caches are pretty self-explanatory. Um, they use files on an accessible drive as the key value store for cache data. Um, this uses serialization and JSON encoding to format this, this data. However, as the file system cache uses file names for keys, it is only able to cache one object per file. It does not have any garbage collection process, resulting in a cache that never removes old content. Uh, APCU cache, we've talked a bit about the PHP side of it, but APCU cache is a typical key value store. Um, so it is optimized for caching operations. Uh, however, the Silverstripe CMS by default will use a Symfony chain cache adapter combined with the file system as a secondary cache. Now, Symfony's chain cache adapter use, uses this as a method for secondary cache fallback. However, the downside of this is that cache writes are applied to all levels of the chain, uh, chain cache adapter. So essentially, you are writing cache data to both caches at once, potentially wasting resources. Uh, OP cache we covered before as well. It's a byte cache. Um, so you may be wondering what if this is a byte cache, not a user cache. How does Silverstripe CMS use this to store user cache data? Um, it is essentially the same thing as a file system adapter. However, rather than using the JSON format, it saves cache content as PHP arrays in PHP files. Um, and so when PHP loads this data using include functionality, um, OP cache sees this as PHP code, precompiles it, and stores in the OP cache um, cache library. Um, so that way it can be consumed at a later date. 
Um, I'll get a bit more into OP cache downsides a little bit later. Um, but so you might be asking yourself, well, what user caching do I use? Now, now this answer really depends on the data you are caching, but we can rule one of these out almost immediately. Uh, do not use OP cache for user cache. Um, OP cache was not designed to be used for user caching. Uh, using OP cache for Silver Stripe CMS user caching data requires a very large amount of shared resources between PHP processes. Um, and with no garbage collection on OP cache and user cache data often changing over time, you will often run out of allocated resources cause, and often cause the PHP uh, process to restart and rebuilding of OP cache frequently. So for applications at scale, OP cache should not be used for user cache data. OP cache can still be enabled um, as it will still cache your PHP uh, files as well. It should just not be used in the context of user data. Uh, if you were using load balance architecture, usage of external ser shared services such as memcache or Redis would be the best as it allows for the sharing of cache between your application pool. However, using one of these services requires implementation of your own cache factory for Silverstripe CMS. Uh, Silverstripe CMS does not support these um, out of the box by default, but there are some modules available online which you can use to connect to these services. Uh, oh, I lost my place there for a sec. So file systems are the slowest of the caching adapters. Um, however, they support the largest amount of data. So they're perfect for large caching, such as partial caching or large data sets. Whereas memory-based caching, such as APCU, mem uh, memcache, and Redis, are much faster and suitable for smaller data sets. Um, so they handle much higher concurrency and better for speed. Now, Silverstripe CMS by default uses the Silverstripe cache factory for each cache namespace. However, Silverstripe's config and injector class allows you to overload the setting to use any factory that is supported. Um, this means you can create your own factory classes for determining the caching qualities of your application. Uh, in this example on the screen, uh, we can see that we are changing the default cache factory to be a memory cache factory. Um, this ensures that the class, config, module, and theme loader classes uh, all use this memory cache factory. These cache namespaces cannot be directly overloaded as they are actually hard coded into the kernel. So we need to use the default here to configure these. However, we don't have to stop there. We can also overload the cache interfaces, which are currently defined in the framework YAML, to use a specific cache factory. Um, and you can see in this example, we, we are setting the cache block cache interface and a few others to be the file system cache factory. So with this flexibility, you can distribute your caches across multiple adapters working with the resources you have available. Um, are you caching large data sets with partial caching? Uh, and memory caching may not be suited for this. Uh, perhaps you're pre-warming your permanent cache data, such as your class or config manifest caches during your deployment process. So a file system cache might be more suited for this as you can package it with your release. So understanding your requirements and how you can go about using these caches can help you with your performance. Uh, Silverstripe CMS optimizations. Um, so now Silverstripe CMS is a very adaptable framework. However, with most PHP, code design can have good and or bad impact to performance. Um, so when developing an application, considerations should be given to performance and resource utilization to ensure that you get the best out of your application, whether it be 10 requests, 10,000 requests, or 10 million requests. So a good thing to look at is uh, the purpose of caching. Um, so when looking at caching, the purpose of caching is to reduce expensive operations. Caching data for the sakes of caching data can actually hurt your application performance more than it improves it. So you should be asking yourself, do you need to cache that data? Uh, caching of unused data is a waste of resources. Um, when caching a data object content, you may be thinking that caching an array of data objects is a good way to do this. Um, however, what ends up happening is you end up caching the entire data object, all its saved values, its previous values, its statuses and states. Um, and all of this is stored in the cache store. So even though you may only be consuming a couple of data points per data object, such as the title or author or name, the amount of resources being wasted is often larger than the value provided. Uh, to get around this, it's often a smart idea to extract the specific details that you are needing into its own array or data set. Um, and then you can cache that data only. Um, this way you're not wasting resources on unused cache data. Evaluation of your cache keys is also important. Um, you may have added a data objects field to a cache key to ensure new cache data is generated when content changes. Um, this is a fairly standard practice within Silverstripe CMS. The problems start to occur when these fields that you have selected become larger than initially expected, um, such as using a field that is like a varchar or something that can be edited over time. 
Um, ensuring you have using fields that have a limited number of potential variances will help reduce wastage through separation of caches um, of the same data. So using enum fields to ensure that people can only select certain amounts of inputs in the database will help ensure that you're only creating a certain amount of cache sets. Don't overload your caching. Um, as I mentioned before, adding caching can potentially just consume additional resources without providing any value. However, sometimes the value provided can work against you if not evaluating for the future. Uh, partial caching on search result pages are some of these degrading value decisions in which there are more content there is to cache and the different ways this data can be searched results in almost every single search page having its own cache key and data, which is wasting valuable resources. So what do we do? We cache for value. Um, if there's no value or future value, it's a waste of resources. Resources cost money and bad caching is a waste of resources. Uh, evaluate whether your caching actually provides value before implementing it. Don't be afraid to move caches at a later date or migrate that cache to a different cache adapter that is cheaper. Uh, code duplication and vendor dependencies. Um, so Silverstripe CMS uses Composer's auto loader as a method of ensuring all your PHP files are included in your application for use. Um, however, this also means that every PHP file that has a definition of PSR for auto loading and using Composer will also be loaded into PHP and consume resources. Um, this means if you have classes that have the same code throughout, um, it will be consuming resources in order to compile and execute that code. Uh, reducing code duplication frees up resources from the auto loader, meaning you have more resources available for performance. Um, this also applies to dependencies in your vendor folder. Um, including a module in your project in which you're only using a small portion of its features can potentially waste resources. So instead, there might be existing functionality in a dependency that's already installed, or maybe the method you are needing is small enough that you can copy and paste it into your own project. Either way, the more we can do to remove unneeded code from our project, the more resources we have available for performance tuning. Uh, generators and looping. Um, when working with large data sets, uh, you can often run into memory exhaustion in PHP while looping over data. Um, Silverstripe ORM by default will actually return data as a complete set when using the get method. Um, this is not ideal when working with large data sets. Um, however, a lot of people aren't aware that the data list class in which the ORM returns has a get generator method, which uses the PHP yield function to provide the data. Um, I won't get into the details as to how generators and yields work, um, however, using generators for large data sets will help reduce resource requirements when working with those data sets. Um, one of the later, later things I want to get into here is unset versus null. Um, so this is one I found quite interesting myself. Um, so PHP doesn't actually have true garbage collection for resources in a true sense like a cache handler would. Um, instead, it uses internal processes to mark and mark deleted data as not used within the memory so that PHP can reuse that memory allocation for other data. So when you use the unset method of PHP, it is essentially telling PHP that when you can, please unlock this memory allocation block so it can be reused. Um, whereas setting a variable to null acts a bit differently. When you set an existing variable to null, it actually adjusts the memory allocation based on the new value. Um, this new value being null means that PHP will reduce the size of the memory allocation to the smallest possible allocation. So it actually affects the total amount of memory allocated. Um, it's, sorry, it actually affects the total amount of allocated memory available. Unsetting a variable is pretty quick, as marking this memory allocation for reuse is a quick operation and allows the next memory allocation to potentially be faster as it reuses that allocation. Um, setting a variable to null, however, is a bit slower and it needs uh, to adjust the size of the memory allocation. Um, so a good way of this unset is faster. Memory allocation stays the same but can be reused where setting to null is slower and the memory allocation size reduces. Um, so when we look at this concept of, so we look at this concept of unset versus null in the uh, context of iterations or loops, um, setting a, a variable to null between iterations is slower than unsetting the variable between iterations. Um, this is because unsetting allows the next iteration to reuse the existing memory allocation while setting to null means that the memory allocation needs to be adjusted down in size for now, but then adjusted back up in size again once the data has been as associated with the variable, essentially being yo-yoed in size. Um, and you can see the two different uh, here. The top one is setting to null and the bottom one is setting uh, is unsetting the variable there. Um, when you're doing an iteration and setting to null, 
there's an extra memory adjustment call made to set that variable smaller, whereas an unset will just put a flag against it and say, yep, you can reuse this when you want. Uh, so wrapping up. Yep, just about over time. Um, so in a summary of what we have talked about today, um, we've covered a lot of things about load balancing and microservices. Um, architecture of your supporting infrastructure can have quite an impact to your application or code design when working at scale. Understanding your requirements, current skills, hosting options will help you decide on the appropriate infrastructure for your application and required configurations to support at scale. Microservice architecture is a relatively new concept compared to load balance architecture. Um, however, it does work nicely with these older concepts. Uh, microservice is a concept of segregation rather than an architecture. So it can often be used with most types of server architecture that is already designed to work at scale. Microservices just takes the old school behemoth style of application development and splits it into smaller parts so they can be worked on and scaled independently. Uh, mod PHP versus fast CGI um, and FPM. Uh, mod PHP is the most popular method of supporting PHP web applications. However, it does, it's not designed to work well at scale. Um, due to its hard dependency on Apache, at scale, it becomes more of a resource consumer, taking away from potential performance improvements through available resources. Whereas fast CGI, including FPM, is a method of abstracting PHP execution from the web server like Apache. This allows you to scale PHP independently of web services themselves, ensuring you're not wasting resources on components that do not need to be scaled. Uh, we touched a bit on resource relationships. Um, resources are highly connected. Limitations or restrictions in a single area can have compounding effects on the other resource components. Just because the CPU is reporting issues does not mean the CPU is the root cause. It is often just the resources that is yelling the loudest at this current point in time. Uh, we talked a lot about balance uh, bottlenecks and performance. Um, so we covered quite a few items around bottlenecks performance within the Silverstripe applications and the supporting infrastructure. Um, if you were to take one thing away from this is that performance at scale is a balance between speed of execution and capability of concurrency. Um, Silverstripe CMS is a cache heavy application. So ensuring you have your cache set correctly in regard to size and operations will help. A poorly configured cache can have negative performance impacts on your application. Uh, applications requirements also change over time. So don't forget to monitor these application settings and values so appropriate adjustments can be made if required, such as increasing or decreasing the amount of memory allocation. Uh, balancing speed and resources. Um, it's often easy to think, if I just chuck more resources at it, I can get better speeds and more concurrency. Um, while this is often correct, it does not take into consideration the cost of those resources required to support the application at scale. Um, understanding what your maximum supported concurrency needs to be will help you understand your, your current resource requirements and costs. Increasing speed of PHP execution allows for resources to be freed up faster for further requests to be served, um, while additional resources can help speed up execution. So it's a balancing act in which the idea is to get execution as fast as possible while using the least amount of resources as possible so you can have concurrency. So yeah, thank you for listening to me rant about on all those things. Uh, apologies if any of those details went over people's heads. However, if you do have any questions about this or any of this content, or would just like to say hi. Um, I'm usually on the Silverstripe community Slack channel throughout most of the week, so don't hesitate to come on and yell at me about something. Yes, thank you, Brett. Very interesting. Um, I often find myself in projects where just hardware is th thrown at a performance problem, and it's uh, really good to understand where the real performance bottlenecks are or where they possibly could be. <laughs> well, some of the few. Yeah, there, there's, there's lots, but I couldn't fill half a day. Yeah, of course. We have some uh, questions. Um, Dave asked some. Yes, the first question. Uh, so the question there is, do you ever find it valuable to bypass the ORM and directly write SQL? Um, sometimes it is valuable to do this. Uh, the ORM will try and make a lot of assumptions based on what you're trying to do with the data. So it might join onto tables that aren't actually needed. Um, it might do left joins when you actually a right join might be appropriate. Um, so when working with large data sets, it often is easier to write SQL manually. Um, what you don't want to do is be writing very large SQL statements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can often get better performance out of multiple smaller queries than you can out of one large one. Um, as you saw in the MySQL query caching side of things, they won't cache queries that have subqueries or that use temporary tables. And so the larger your queries get and the more complicated they get, uh, 
the less they are able to actually utilize this caching feature. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we cannot um, uh, have all questions answered, but uh, maybe th that on Johannes. Yeah, that, that was that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm uh, pointing so at the TV. <laughs> this question is, uh, any plans to support separation and read of write database connections in the Silverstripe core? Um, so I'm not sure about the Silverstripe uh, CMS itself. Um, I'm more on the infrastructure and platform side of things at the company. Um, but I have been talking to uh, someone um, on the Silverstripe community chat uh, who has uh, successfully been able to do this with uh, separation of read and writes across their database. Um, I wasn't quite sure how they've done it. I've asked them to provide me um, some code snippets to show me how they've done it because I've tried to give it a go before using things like uh, AWS Aurora. Um, but it does sound like it is possible. Yeah. Then a last question from Herbert. Um, about partial caching. So the question there is, uh, how often do you yourself use partial caching in your projects and for what size of sites? Um, so a bit of a disclaimer, I, I don't actually build websites. Um, I no, okay. mostly work in support bug fixing. Um, I've, I've been in uh, incident, uh, incident handling and stuff like that for many, many years. Um, so I usually deal with all the code that the new developers throw at us and bug fixing in that way and dealing with performance and stuff there. Um, but I do see the benefits of partial caching, um, especially when it comes to around um, repeated content um, or lot large content as well. Um, it really is a dependence on what sort of data you are providing. Um, I think the threshold starts become whether or not can this data be put into a user cache um, in which if you're including HTML and stuff like that, I wouldn't put it in a user cache, in which case partial caching makes a lot more sense. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you very much um, for um, this great talk. Let's continue the, uh, the discussion on Slack. And we see us hopefully next time on, on StripeCon. Thank you. Awesome. Sounds great. Thank you very much.